Hello, beautiful humans, and welcome to another episode of the Midlife Revolution. I'm your host, Vegan Connor, and today we're going to talk about what might happen if you are visited by a pair of Mormon missionaries. You've seen these lovely ladies and young men out there on the streets, maybe knocking on doors. Maybe they've even come to your door. The classic white short sleeve button down shirt with tie, the classic black name tag declaring elder or sister. You've seen them on their bikes. You've seen them talking to strangers on the street. And maybe someday they will come to your door. Here's a lovely guide on Amazon a Catholic survival kit, what to do when missionaries come knocking. Honestly, I love to see these bright, smiling faces. My daughter served a Mormon mission right after she graduated from high school. And I always am going to talk to missionaries when they come around, invite them in, and wish them the best, although I may not be interested in listening to their message. I will talk a little bit later in a subsequent episode with my daughter about her mission experience. And you may be shocked to know that a lot of these young men and women are paying their own way to be on their mission. The last time that I checked, it cost about $450 a month to attend a mission and young men and women are expected to pay their own way. In addition, they receive very little help from the church in paying for meals and other things like that. A lot of them are living in apartments that have been leased for a very long time, and the missionaries in the area have been living in those apartments for years and years, just coming and going as they leave their mission. And many of them don't get enough to eat during the day. They have to be out teaching for a certain number of hours of day. They're up very early in the morning. And it used to be that the members were allowed to feed the missionaries once a week, but now they've sort of decrease the amount of time that they want to have missionaries in the homes of members. And so the last that I heard, the missionaries were allowed to come over and share a message with you, but not to share a meal. They preferred that the missionaries be out talking to people who are not members of the church. So I'm not sure how much of that has changed, but we will have more discussions about it. The reason I mention it is because whenever I see missionaries, I always want to ask them if they have enough to eat, if they're feeling safe, if they're well cared for, and if they they feel safe on their mission and with their leadership, or if there's anything that they want to talk about, I open the door for that. I always offer them water when they come through my neighborhood, just because they're out there in the heat a lot. And oftentimes I will send them off with food or with money to go buy food because I know a lot of them don't get enough to eat on their mission. So the mission rules have changed a lot over the years, obviously, but also the topics that the missionaries talk about have changed a lot. And you may be curious about what they might say to you if they come to your door, but you may also not want to invite them in and endure that. So this episode is just for that. I will tell you some of the things that they might talk about at your door, and then you can make a choice about whether you want to have them come in or not. First of all, when a missionary comes and knocks on your door, If you answer the door and have a conversation at all, that conversation gets recorded in what's called the area book. The missionaries want to keep a record of who answers the door and who doesn't, who's friendly to the missionaries and who is not. And if there's any little spark of interest at all, opening the door's interest, then they're going to keep your name and your contact information in their area book so that when they get transferred out of the area and the next missionaries come in, The next missionaries know that you're a safe person. You can knock on their door. They're going to notate it if you offer them food or drink. They're going to notate it if you come in and offer to have a conversation. If you say, no, thanks, I'm an atheist, they're going to make a note of that as well. They may still come to try and contact you, even if you declare a religious affiliation or no religious affiliation. So they keep track of all of these things and keep records so that the next missionaries have an idea of where to start when they're in your neighborhood. Now, a long time ago, there used to be actual physical pamphlets that the missionaries would use on each one of their visits to your house. And the first pamphlet that they used was a guidebook for the missionaries to use that would sort of guide them through a number of topics and lessons for you. Nowadays, missionaries will say, hey, can we share a message with you about families, which means they wanna talk about temples, eternal families, how your family can be together. 
they may say, can we share a message with you about Jesus Christ? And then they want to share how they believe that Jesus Christ visited the people on this continent. And that is what is part of the Book of Mormon is the record of that visit. They may say, we'd like to share a message with you about God. And then they'll probably talk about what they call the plan of salvation or the plan of happiness. And they'll take you through what they believe is what happened before we got here to earth, why we're here on the earth, and then what's going to happen after we leave the earth. So today's missionaries are trained more just to have a conversation with you. They may even say, can we share a Bible verse with you, in which they might share a verse with you from Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible, which might differ from the version of the Bible that you read. It's all of this is just to open the door to have a religious conversation, to find out what religion you are, if you're satisfied with your religion, if you're questioning religion, or if you have no religion and you're searching for meaning and purpose in your life. But back in the 80s, they had discussion pamphlets. And when a missionary goes to the missionary training center, what they were learning was how to contact a person, develop a relationship with them, open the door for teaching opportunities, and then exactly what to teach. They would go through these little pamphlets while they were sitting there at your kitchen table. They had a very specific outline as to what they were going to address with you, what scriptures to read, what questions to ask, and all of that. So I want to present those today because When missionaries come into your home to teach you about Mormonism or the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they're going to paint for you a very basic picture of some of the most important doctrines to them. But there's a lot of things that they're not going to tell you as well. Of course, they're going to leave out problematic racial history. Of course, they don't want to talk about polygamy. They'll say that that's in the past. Of course, they're not going to want to talk about things like the CES letter or anything that challenges the official Mormon narrative. They're not going to want to talk about the recent SEC fine or any of the financial scandals that have come up. They're not going to want to talk about Tim Ballard being excommunicated. They're not going to want to talk about the abuse claims or the settlements with the Boy Scouts of America over abuse. All of those things are off the table for missionary discussions. So unfortunately, it's not really a situation where they're trying to convert you with informed consent. They're trying to convert you as quickly as possible by sort of appealing to your sensibilities about spirituality and God. They want to ask you to pray about things rather than using your critical thinking skills to logically analyze what they're saying. And their goal is to get you baptized as quickly as they can. And then more information will come later. I know this is true because I was a member of the church for 40 years of my life, uh, arguably 45 years if you count my childhood as well. And I was also a ward missionary, which meant that my job was to meet with all of the people who'd been recently baptized and teach them a second set of lessons, the lessons that come after a person has visited with the missionaries and gone through the baptismal process. The lessons I was teaching didn't cover any of those problematic topics either. They dug a little bit deeper into what is expected of you as a member of the LDS Church. And really some of it was cultural, but there was a little bit of doctrinal stuff in there. Things like the word of wisdom, not drinking, smoking, all of those kinds of things. And it was a little bit of a deeper dive into some of the doctrinal things as well. There was a set of 12 lessons when I was a ward missionary. So every time a person got baptized, I would visit with them once a week during those 12 lessons. Sometimes we would give those lessons during Sunday school on Sunday, but my job was really more for those people who had gotten baptized but weren't attending Sunday school at church on Sunday. And so I would go into their homes and try to invite them back to church, say, we miss you, we love you, we'd love to have you. And also here's a spiritual discussion. How are you feeling about your spirituality? Are you praying? Are you reading your scriptures every day? And it was my job to do that for about two years while I was an active believing member of the church. So I want to go through with you now what the discussion manuals looked like back in the 80s when there was a manual for every single lesson. Um, These come courtesy of Imgur, where anybody can post things and turn it into a searchable PDF format. So you can see it says the plan of our Heavenly Father, discussion one, uniform system for teaching the gospel. It was very important to the church and still is that all of the missionaries are teaching the same lessons 
and that they're presenting the same information in the same way. No going off book here. And there's a set of instructions here for the lesson, planning for the discussion. And this would all happen before they even come into your home, before they even leave their apartment for the day. So the LDS missionaries will get up at six o'clock. They're supposed to have personal scripture study. Then they're supposed to exercise. Then they're supposed to have companion study, which means them and their companion will study the scriptures together. And they're supposed to say a prayer about who they're supposed to teach that day, get guidance from God or the Holy Spirit about what neighborhoods to visit. And so they'll show up in your neighborhood spiritually prepared to meet somebody who wants to learn about the gospel. So when you look at this planning for the discussion phase right here, it says prepare to teach this discussion by thinking about the investigators needs. People who were learning about the church were called investigators at the time. And so they were instructed to think about the needs of you as an individual. And also they were instructed to pray about what you might need to hear about and what potential problems might come up. Um, it says then how, plan how you might present the discussion to meet these needs. For example, consider which of your own experiences might be meaningful to them to hear. What examples might help them understand clearly or resolve their concerns? Which Book of Mormon passages you could share with them? Which of their own experiences might relate to your message? Specifically plan what you will do to prepare these investigators to feel the spirit, two, when to invite them to make commitments like praying or getting baptized, and three, how you will follow up to help them keep their commitments. The main focus of the discussion should be the Book of Mormon and the prophet Joseph Smith. Do not spend too much time on the first two principles, especially if the, the investigators basically agree with what you present. Leave enough time to discuss the truths that are unique to the restored gospel. After the discussion, the investigator's strongest impressions should be of the Book of Mormon and the prophet Joseph Smith. Through them, we gained our understanding of God and his plan. Now, the doctrinal overview, there are six points to this, and I can totally understand why they started to narrow down the discussion format, because there's a lot of material to go over here, and you could, even if you only spent 10 minutes on each one, that's a full hour, but these topics are pretty deep for just 10 minutes of discussion. So, here are the main principles. God the Father has a plan for our happiness. It's called the plan of salvation. If they go into describing the plan of salvation, that's probably like another 20 or 30 minute discussion. Number two, Jesus Christ has a central mission in the plan, meaning he's very important to the plan. Number three, God reveals the truth about his plan through prophets. It's very important for investigators to understand what a prophet is and relate to you that there is a prophet on the earth today. Number four, the prophet Joseph Smith is a modern witness of Jesus Christ. Through him, God has restored knowledge about the divine plan. Number five, the Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ that clearly explains the divine plan. And six, through the Holy Ghost, each person can know this message is true. And then commitments during this discussion, you need to help the investigators feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. This will prepare them to make the commitments that lead to conversion and baptism. During this discussion, the investigators should commit themselves to one, read from the Book of Mormon and pray to know that it is true. The following reading assignment is suggested. And then they give the specific verses and chapters that they want investigators to read as homework after the discussion is over. Then they want them to pray that to know that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God and take part in the next discussion, preferably the remaining five discussions at a specific time. So missionaries were taught to go ahead and get a commitment from the investigators to come back for a second discussion and get a commitment from them that they were going to read the chapters in the Book of Mormon and pray about whether or not they were true. In fact, you'll notice it wasn't presented that way. It said, pray to know that the Book of Mormon is true. Pray to know that Joseph Smith was a prophet. So they didn't want to even introduce the possibility of doubt there. So once they get to the investigator's home, they are to create a learning atmosphere. They want you to become acquainted and build a relationship of trust, and they line out exactly how, this, how to do this. You might share information about yourself, including your hometown, family, and schooling, your interests, and why you came on a mission. Although now missionaries are 
counseled not to talk about their hometown or their family or their schooling. They're taught to focus only on the mission. So for example, they told us as members that we were not supposed to ask missionaries where they were from. We were supposed to ask them how long they'd been on their mission. They wanted to keep the elders and the sisters focused on what they were doing and not thinking about being at home. And so that was just another way that they sort of tried to keep missionaries on track and thinking about the right things while they were on their mission. Next, you might find out about the investigators, family, work, interests, religious attitudes, experiences that led them to investigate the church, acquaintance with members of the church, knowledge of the church, and their, their experiences with people who are LDS. If you spent any time at all in sales, you know that these are sales tactics. This is a way to build a relationship. You're asking about their important things. They're asking about your important things. You're sharing some things. And you're asking them to share really personal information about their religious beliefs as well. So they're trying to really get you to be vulnerable in this first discussion right off the bat. Then it says, establish a reverent atmosphere. Set a reverent and relaxed atmosphere of the discussion. Remember that you're a guest in the investigator's home. You should, with the investigator's permission, arrange the seating so all can participate comfortably. That's interesting. I've never had a missionary do that in my house. Um, try to remove distractions. For instance, ask whether you may turn off the television or radio. I did have them do this when they were teaching my former spouse, who was not a member of the church when we first got married. They would often ask, can we turn off the TV? If he was in the kitchen doing dishes after dinner, they would say, would you join us over here? Rather than doing dishes while we talk, they really want your full undivided attention. They say, recognize the family head, which of course is gonna be the man, invite all family members to participate. With the permission of the family head, offer a prayer. And then later they would ask you to be the one to pray. Then they're supposed to introduce the discussion and they're going to talk briefly about the points that they're going to cover in the discussion. They're going to prepare you for what to expect. For example, they should feel free to express their feelings, ask questions, tell you when they don't understand something and sincerely try to find out whether your message is true. So there are five, actually there are six principles in this first discussion. And you can see this is quite a lengthy pamphlet. It's a lot to go through. And I can imagine a set of missionaries spending a couple of hours on all of this, especially if somebody is either not really familiar with religion or with the scriptures, with the Bible at all. If they aren't really practicing any particular religion, it would be a lot to go through. And you could spend probably a half an hour on each one of these points and it would probably feel really overwhelming to try and get all of this crammed into one lesson, which I think is why the church has gotten away from this particular format of teaching. And they've gone to more informal, shorter discussions where you spend 15 to 20 minutes talking about a gospel principle. I think that the focus is still to try and get the person to come to church right away the following Sunday. And also the next commitment is to try and get them to agree to be baptized as quickly as possible, sometimes even with just one discussion. There used to be a rule that people had to attend church two times before they could get baptized. I don't know if that's still a rule or not, but the person getting baptized does have to go to an interview with the bishop, basically to confirm what was taught and then make sure that they understand it and make sure that they are willing to get baptized. As far as I know, there is absolutely no point at which a bishop interviewing a potential person to get baptized or a missionary presenting the material, at no point are they going to ask you if you know about any of the other historical things of the church or attempt to teach you those things. They're going to present the prescribed information and they're going to get you to commit to it as quickly as possible. So the main focus of these discussions back then was to get into the first vision of Joseph Smith, where he claimed to see God and Jesus Christ, and they told him not to join any of the churches because none of them were correct, but that he needed to wait for further instructions from God about what to do regarding religion. That's really the focus of this first discussion, is to get people to understand that we can only find out about God through a prophet or through the revelation of God through a prophet. And they want to make sure that you understand that Joseph Smith was a prophet because he saw God in Jesus Christ and then claimed to speak for him 
for the rest of his life. Getting you to understand that principle is really important. And the reason I want to bring this one up today, it's the first one that most missionaries will go over with you. But there are some things even about this first vision of Joseph Smith that they won't tell you about and things that I didn't even know about as a member of the church. And it wasn't until about 2015 that the LDS Church started posting on their website these things called gospel topic essays, which addressed some of the history of the church that's become problematic in the last years because the more people ask questions about it, the less they believe in the truth claims that they were taught since they were a kid. So we'll get back to that a little bit later. I just want to show you what is in the rest of this lesson manual and what the missionaries go over. So principle one, we believe in God. Most people believe in a supreme being, even though they may call him by different names. We know that God lives and we want to share with you our feelings about him. God is perfect, all wise, and all powerful. He's also merciful, kind, and just, except when he's not. We know that he can have that we can have faith in him. We can love him with all our hearts. And then next to it, it says, find out what the investigators believe about God and how they feel about God. Next, God is our Father in heaven. We're children of our Father in heaven. We're created in his image. Because he's the Father of all people, we are brothers and sisters. And that's why LDS people call each other brother and their last name or sister and their last name. We don't really use first names in the church. God has a plan for us. As our Father, God loves us. He wants us to progress and be happy. He wants us to become more like him. He prepared a plan that will bring us joy in this life and eternal life with him. This plan is called the plan of salvation. Now, sometimes they call it the plan of happiness. Then they tell the missionaries to testify. Express your feelings about your belief in God, his wisdom, and his love for us. What it means to you to know that you're a child of God and the happiness you've found through your efforts to grow and become more like God. These testify experiences sort of start to follow a really familiar pattern and when you listen to people in the LDS church talk about their beliefs, sometimes they'll call it a testimony. And sometimes they'll say, I would like to bear my testimony, which basically means they just want to tell you what they believe. Once a month in the LDS church, there is a fast and testimony meeting where members are expected to give up two meals. They're expect, expected to fast for two meals and then give up the cost of those meals to feed the poor and needy. This is a concept that I actually really loved. As a member of the church, I thought it was wonderful for me to make a sacrifice and to give money so that other people could be fed. That made a lot of sense to me. It sounded like something that Jesus would have taught, and I really loved that part of the church. Um, then there are some scriptural resources over here. And what would happen in these fast and testimony meetings is that you were, you were supposed to come to church having fasted for two meals, and then the leader of the congregation who's called a bishop would open up the meeting for anybody to come and share their testimony or what they believe. So it was sort of like, I like to call it open mic Sunday because anybody could get up there and talk about anything. And as I got a little bit older, the church leadership in Salt Lake started to tell people, you really need to restrict your testimony to some basic gospel principles we don't want to hear travel logs. People get up there all the time and say, I recently took a trip to blah, blah, blah. And when I attended sacrament meeting there, this is what happened. Um, they really don't want people to share things about their sins. For example, they don't want people to get up and say, I really struggle with the word of wisdom and I had a drink last night and I promised myself I'm not going to do it again and I'm going to repent now. They also don't really want you to share things about your personal medical journey, although a lot of people do that because we do believe, Mormons do believe in the laying on of hands for the healing of the sick. And so a lot of people use testimony meeting as an opportunity to talk about a time when they were very sick and then were healed after a priesthood blessing. And things got out of hand a lot of the time. Um, I heard a lot of very sensitive information in church meetings that I didn't feel was appropriate to share. And it can be really overwhelming for a new member to come in during one of these testimony meetings and hear people sharing all of this personal information. So that would have been an opportunity for somebody to come up. And the leadership of the church did tell us we need to restrict it to these five things. We want you to talk about your belief in the Book of Mormon. 
in the restoration of the gospel, in the prophet Joseph Smith, in the current prophet, and I forget there was another one, the scriptures or something like that. So they tried to keep people narrowed down to these little topics, but it didn't always work. And a lot of times it ended up being really uncomfortable and embarrassing. More than once I heard people make political statements from the stand, and more than once I heard people, more than once people were asked to step down before they had finished their very, very long testimony. All of that to say, testimonies can start to sound like a little bit of a prescribed, a little bit of a script. And so missionaries coming into your home will bear their testimony. They'll say something like, I want you to know that I believe that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. I know that he restored the gospel of Jesus Christ to the earth. And I know that the Book of Mormon is the word of God. And I know this because I prayed about it. The Holy Ghost bore witness to me that it was true. And I know that if you pray to God, that the Holy Ghost will bear witness to you too. That's kind of what that's going to sound like and look like. And at the end of the discussion, the missionaries are going to ask you to pray, or they're going to give you an assignment to promise that you'll pray about the things they've taught you. The second principle is the divine sonship of Jesus Christ. Uh, we need help to overcome sin and death. Without the help of our Father in heaven, we could not benefit from the plan of salvation. Now, I'm pretty certain that the missionaries also during this lesson were asked to present the plan of salvation, which was a formal written plan they wanted people to understand. And again, this could have been an entire lesson all by itself. It feels super overwhelming to put all of this stuff just in one visit. But I want to share with you what the plan of salvation looks like. And I just went on Pinterest and was able to find this little graphic. And you can see lots of different graphics of the plan of salvation. Um, if you look it up online, you'll see all these different versions. And this particular one on Pinterest, it, the reason I picked this one is because they started to incorporate the idea that the plan of salvation is a plan of love. And so they use the word or the letters in the word love to explain this. Now, it starts over on the very left side with pre-earth life. We believed that we existed as spirit children in sort of a heaven before we came to earth, and that there was a war in heaven where God wanted to send children to his children to earth to test them and to see if they would follow his teachings, even when they weren't in his presence. And... Mormons believe that Satan came forward and said, I have a great idea. Why don't we compel everyone to follow you? And then all of your children will get to return to heaven. They won't have any choice, but they will follow you. And then everybody gets to go to heaven. And Jesus came forward and he said, I have a better plan. My idea is that you give everyone free will and they can choose to follow you or not. And the legend goes that, of course, Jesus won. But God said, well, in that case, we're going to need a savior. And Satan said, you know, send me as a savior. Savior, I'll make sure everybody follows the plan. And Jesus said, send me and I'll sacrifice myself so that people can repent and return to you. And the legend is that Jesus won out and became our savior. That's what happened in the pre-earth life. And then there was the creation. And then at the bottom of the L, that's us coming to earth, receiving our bodies, our spirits and our bodies come together. And then we have this earth experience where we get to choose whether we're going to follow God or not. Then when we die, we immediately go to either paradise or spirit prison. Spirit prison is for those people who were not righteous on the earth. They did not have the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they had to be sort of set aside. Paradise is where you get to be with your loved ones and with Jesus Christ before, before the judgment comes. The Mormons believe that if you died without the opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ or become converted to the gospel of Jesus Christ, that you can still, in spirit prison, be taught about Jesus. That's one of the reasons why Mormons do genealogy, family history work. And that's one of the functions of a temple. Temples are not attended on Sunday. You go to the temple at other times during the week, and there's a baptismal font in the temple. And what you would do is you would go to your family history. You would find somebody who had not been a member of the church while they were alive, somebody who had passed away. They had to be 
at least 110 years since they had been alive. And you would put all of their information into the LDS database. You would print out a little card and you would take that card with you to the baptistry in the temple. Then you would go into the waters of baptism dressed all in white. There would be an elder there who was going to perform the baptism and a witness there who would witness the baptism and then somebody who would actually record the date and time that you were baptized. And you would give this little card with your ancestor's name on it to the elder and the elder would say, he would call my name and he would say, Sister Iden, I now baptize you for and in behalf of, and then you would say the person's name, Aunt Sarah, and he would, he would repeat it and say, Aunt Sarah, who is dead. And then he would dunk you under the water and bring you up. And that would be a recorded ordinance that that person had officially been baptized. And what Mormons believe is at that point that Aunt Sarah, who is already in heaven and has been dead, has been waiting for this day for a long time because while she was in spirit prison, she had people teaching her the gospel, teaching her about Jesus Christ. And she said, I believe it. I accept it. And they say, oh, that's great, but you don't have a body anymore, so you can't be baptized. So you can't progress and go to paradise until somebody on earth gets baptized for you. And so we as LDS people believed that once we were baptized for that person, that they could then move out of spirit prison and into paradise. So that's a little tangent about baptism. That came about mainly because I was trying to talk about the plan of salvation. So we'll go back to that now. So after uh, being in paradise or spirit prison, then we believed that everybody on earth who ever lived will be resurrected and their body and their spirit will come back together. And then we will all be judged and we will go to one of three kingdoms based on our faithfulness. Now, Mormons believe that the telestial kingdom is basically basically going to be heaven on earth. It's the earth, but like in a renewed paradisical state. And that the terrestrial kingdom is going to be even cooler than that. And the celestial kingdom is going to be the only place where you can live with God and Jesus Christ and your family members. In order to get into the celestial kingdom, you have to not only be baptized, but you also have to go through the temple and receive other ordinances and make other promises to God then you have to live those commandments for your entire life and quote unquote endure to the end before you can move on to the celestial kingdom and if i were good to go to the celestial kingdom but some of my family members didn't make it i could go down and visit them in the other kingdoms but they couldn't come up and visit me in the celestial kingdom now on this particular graphic there is one part that is left out and that is outer darkness. It's something that they kind of have stopped talking about in the plan of salvation, but it's definitely something that I learned about as a child. It's that scary version of Mormon hell, basically, where you're separated from God and from your loved ones, because at one point you knew the truth, but then you rejected it. So in this larger graphic over here to the right, you can see things, um, are a little bit more, let's see if it'll go if I visit here. Yeah, things are a little bit more um, analyzed a little more clearly. We have pre-mortal existence over here, and then there's a veil of forgetfulness that comes over us when we're born, when we come to, to the earth. So we don't remember being um, in our pre-mortal existence with our family and the war in heaven and all of that. So then when you die, the spirit goes to either paradise or spirit prison and your body goes to the grave. Then at the resurrection, your spirit and body are united. Then there's the final judgment where you can go to one of these three kingdoms. And it does mention outer darkness over here. Now, outer darkness is for people who knew the truth or had the fullness of the truth and then rejected it. So anybody who leaves the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is going to outer darkness because it said that we knew the truth, we accepted it, we made these promises and covenants, and then at some point in our lives, we rejected it. So we don't get to go to any of the kingdoms, but we get to go to outer darkness where we'll be separated from God and from our families and where we basically get to hang out with Satan for the rest of eternity. So that's pretty cool. Not something that's usually mentioned in the missionary lessons, um, unless you just get a missionary who is interested in talking about those kind of things, or if you have an investigator who asks about it. 
So back to the super long lesson that you're going through the first time the missionaries are coming over. At least they did this back in the 80s. So the plan of salvation gets wrapped up and then we go to principle two. All of that, you guys, it was just principle one. <laughs> So in principle two, it's important for missionaries to teach you that Jesus Christ was the, was the divine son of God, that he was sent to earth to fulfill the plan of salvation, that he is our savior, that he overcame sin and death, and that he showed us how to fulfill the plan by repenting of our sins. Now, there is a ton of information here, lots of scriptural references. Again, you could spend a whole hour with investigators talking about this if they didn't know about Jesus Christ or believe that he was a savior prior to this. Then there's sort of this little challenge down here, find out whether the investigators have seen blessings enter their lives because they followed the example of Christ or did Christ-like things. So again, you're trying to get the investigators to engage in a discussion where they reveal really personal experiences and information about themselves, and that sort of helps bond them to the missionaries. Which of the teachings of Christ have meant the most to them? And then have faith to do what he taught. They want you to know, if you have faith to do what Jesus Christ taught, you'll find peace in this life. And also you can become more like him and like our Heavenly Father and return to live with them after this life. And again, there's another little section for a testimony over here. Then on to principle three, they talk about God's pattern. He chooses witnesses, the prophets testify of Christ, the Holy Ghost confirms the truth, and we're invited to obey. And they're going to come back to this God's pattern all the time while they're teaching you. And they're also going to remind you that in the Bible, there's an example of this where God chose a witness, the prophet testified of Christ, the Holy Ghost confirmed the testify, and then we're invited to obey. And they, re they send you to the scripture in Amos 3, 7, which is God will do nothing save he reveal his secrets to his servants, the prophets. That was one of the scriptures that we had to memorize. It's still back there in my Mormon memory banks. So then they want to find out whether the investigators understand what a prophet is and how he can help us know the truth. And there are some examples over here of biblical prophets. No doubt they're going to talk about Moses and how the Ten Commandments were revealed to him. And that was an example of a prophet. Basically, anybody in the Bible that testified of Jesus Christ was a prophet. And then you want to know whether they understand how the Holy Ghost can help you recognize the truth of a prophet's words. Often at this point, the missionaries will talk about prayer and about the Holy Ghost. And LDS people believe that if you pray to God and then just sit quietly, that you can have a spiritual confirmation of something being true. And basically what that is, is just a good warm feeling. So if you say a prayer and at the end of the prayer, you feel peaceful and you feel a warm feeling, then that's supposed to be the Holy Ghost confirming to you that something is true. When really, sometimes it's just the act of praying and getting quiet with yourself and having some meditation that makes you feel peaceful. And then people learn to relate that feeling to getting some kind of a revelation from God. And this can become really problematic because at this point, you're basically teaching yourself to confirm your own bias about what you do or do not want to believe. So I could pray, for example, to know if I'm supposed to be the next leader of the church. And if I get a good, warm, peaceful feeling and I sort of hear a still small voice telling me, yes, Megan, you're going to be the next bishop of the digital first ward, then I can go out and declare that to people and say, I received a revelation from God that I'm supposed to be the bishop of the digital first ward. And nobody can argue with me because it came from God. I received that witness. I received that warm feeling in my heart. And so you can see where it's really easy for this to become problematic. Now, the leaders of the church in Salt Lake have always said, nobody can get revelation for anyone but themselves. The only person that can get revelation for the worldwide church is the prophet. The only person that can get revelation for the ward is the bishop. So the bishop assigns leadership positions. No person is supposed to be able to go to the bishop and say, hey, I got a revelation that I'm supposed to be the head of the women's organization or any of that. So there is supposed to be a chain of authority, but I hope that it's easy for you to see as it is for me to see that this idea of receiving personal revelation 
and using good feelings or elevated emotions to confirm that something that you're hearing or feeling is from God can be really problematic. And we have seen it lead to a lot of really disturbing things, not the least of which are the Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow horrible case that we've just been through. So I want you to know where that comes from. Now, if we go back to the lesson, the missionaries are going to confirm with you that you understand God's pattern and that you understand how to receive a witness from the Holy Ghost that something is true. And then they want the missionaries to express their feelings about their faith in God and how the Holy Ghost has confirmed their understanding of the truth. Finally, in principle four, we're going to get to the first vision, which was really the goal of this whole lesson in the first place was to tell you what a prophet is and then to tell you that we have a prophet on the earth today because of what Joseph Smith did. Now, they're going to go through these points methodically. In our day, God has followed his pattern for revealing truth. He chose a prophet who learned about the plan of salvation from firsthand experience. This prophet was Joseph Smith. He was confused about religion, so in 1820, Joseph Smith was just a 14-year-old boy. He was confused by the different ideas being taught about religion. Churches all claimed to teach the truth about God, but Joseph was confused by the differences among their teachings. And he described his feelings in these words, and then they tell you to read from Joseph Smith history, which is printed in the Mormon scriptures. And so it comes in a big book of scripture. It makes it look like it's part of the scriptures, like the revealed word of God. And then they go on to say, one day Joseph read a passage in the Bible that showed him how to overcome this confusion. And that was to pray. They're going to read from the book of James, where they say, if any, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. And so Joseph decided to go and do just as the Bible said. He would ask God in prayer. One spring morning, he went into a nearby grove of trees. He knelt down and began to pray to God with all of his heart. Because of his great faith, he fully expected God to answer his prayer. Now, this is the story that I was taught as a girl growing up in the church. It was the story that was portrayed in numerous types of media. There were books, there were songs, there were posters, there were stories, there were movies. We got all kinds of information that was printed based on the story that you just heard. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expand on it just a little bit so you have all of the information that you need to have for the information I'm going to give you next after this. Joseph saw God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son. In his own words, this is what happened. Joseph says, quote, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description, standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son. Hear him. In answer to his prayer, God the Father and Jesus Christ visited young Joseph. So next, Joseph Smith was a prophet of God. Through this and other experiences, Joseph Smith was called as a prophet. He was much like Moses and other biblical prophets. They also saw God and were called to preach his message. Joseph is a witness of Christ. Because he saw and talked with the resurrected Savior, Joseph Smith is a powerful witness of Jesus Christ. Through him, God revealed the truths of the plan of salvation, including the divine mission of Jesus Christ. They asked the missionaries to testify that Joseph Smith's vision is true, that he really did see God in Jesus Christ. They want you to testify of the importance of his divine call as a witness of Christ and to testify about Joseph Smith's calling to restore the truth about the plan of salvation. Then they want you to find out how the investigators feel about your instruction on Joseph Smith. And there are a bunch of other scriptures that they will read you that back all of this up, one from the Book of Mormon and three from the Doctrine and Covenants, which were Joseph Smith's own writings. So that's what they're going to use to back all of that up. Now, keep in mind, the first vision, it's the cornerstone of Mormonism. The church stands and falls on the first vision. If Joseph Smith did not see God in Jesus Christ, and if he was not told by God in Jesus Christ 
not to join any of the churches, but to wait for further instruction. If that didn't happen, then all of Mormonism pretty much is made up. If Joseph Smith made up his first vision, then probably Mormonism is made up too. The, at least that's the conclusion that I came to. So imagine how disturbing it was for me to then go to the LDS.org website to the Gospel Topic Essays and find out that there is more than one version of the first vision. Now, these Gospel Topic Essays were sort of buried on the church website. You do have to go looking for them in order to find them. And the church didn't announce really that they were putting these gospel topic essays up here. So I didn't even know about these essays until after I left the church over learning some other problematic parts of church history. And so it was really disturbing to me to know that at least five years before I stopped going to church, that this information was out there and the church just quietly put it out there without telling members about it or really announcing it to anybody. So here's what the church's own website, you can see right up here at the top of the tab that it's churchofjesuschrist.org. If you type into your search engine, gospel, uh, LDS gospel topic essays, you can get directed to this site. And then it gives you, I'll just go back. Um, when you go to the essays page, actually this is the church history topics page. So I'll even go, go back and, and tell you how hard this is to find. So. You, if you go to LDS.org or churchofjesuschrist.org, this is what you're going to see. This is the main page. Uh, actually, no, it's not. I'll go back one more. There we go. This is the main page of the churchofjesuschrist.org. It used to be LDS.org. Um, here is what we believe. Learn about Jesus Christ. Find meaning in your life. Navigate life's challenges. Come visit a church. You can put your full address in there and find a church building to go to. Here's some FAQ for you. You can request a visit from the missionaries. Here's a message from the current president of the Corporation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Russell Nelson. These are some just, you know, what to expect at church, what our beliefs are, get to know us, latest news from the church, the official news, the whitewash news, the news that they want you to see. And then all of these down here, you, all the clickable things up there available down here too. So this is the main page. Now, in order to get to the gospel topic essays, I have to go here, which scriptures, general conference, come follow me, which is like the Sunday school curriculum, the gospel library, the media library, music library, life help topics and questions. So you have to come all the way to topics and questions. And these are like the main topics right here. Additional topics church history. So if we go to the church history topics, you can scroll through, and this is alphabetical. These are notable people and events in church history and around American history during the time that the church was being formed. But if I want to know anything about the first vision, I have to go all the way down to Joseph Smith. Uh, not Joseph F. Smith, not Joseph Fielding Smith, Joseph Smith and Plural Marriage, Joseph Smith Jr., Joseph Smith Sr., Translation of the Bible, 1826 Trial, 1844 Campaign for President. Here we go, Joseph Smith's first vision accounts. Now there's a little blurb right here, and then you have to go to church resources where it says first vision accounts, gospel topics at topics.lds.org. So if you just type in to your search engine topics.lds.org. It will take you to the page of the gospel topic essays. And we're just going to click on first vision accounts. And so this is what's going to come up. Now, I'm going to just read this to you. And I want you to keep in mind what the missionary discussion already said, that Joseph was 14 years old, that he went into the woods to pray because he didn't know what church to join. He saw two personages, God the Father and Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ spoke to him and told him that all the churches were an abomination, that he should join none of them, and that he should wait for more knowledge to come from God. So this is what the Gospel Topic essay says about that. 
Joseph Smith recorded that God the Father and Jesus Christ appeared to him in a grove of trees near his parents' home in western New York State when he was about 14 years old. Concerned by his sins and unsure which spiritual path to follow, Joseph sought guidance by attending meetings, reading scriptures, and praying. In answer, he received a heavenly manifestation. Joseph shared and documented the first vision as it came to be known on multiple occasions. He wrote or assigned scribes to write four different accounts of the vision. Now, this is not something that I heard as a child. All I knew that there was one was that there was one story. It was referred to as the Wentworth letter, and it was someone inquiring about the church. And in response, Joseph Smith wrote down his first vision account. I had no idea that there were other accounts or that other people wrote about it. And I had no idea that Joseph himself wrote an account that predated that Wentworth letter account. Um, so Joseph Smith published two accounts of the first vision during his lifetime. The first of these known today as Joseph Smith history was canonized in the Pearl of Great Price and thus became the best known account. The two unpublished accounts recorded in Joseph Smith's earliest autobiography and later a journal were generally forgotten until historians working for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints rediscovered and published them in the 1960s. Now, this is actually not true because what actually happened is that Joseph Fielding Smith discovered the first written account of Joseph's first vision in Joseph Smith's diary, and he cut it out of the diary and secreted it away into a vault. The reason that we have this information is due to historian Sandra Tanner researching these documents and seeing some of them firsthand and realizing that Joseph's journal now, it's very clear that somebody taped those pages back into Joseph's journal. And we do, I believe, have a firsthand account from Sandra Tanner about her research on this topic. And we also have some journal entries that confirm that this first account was cut out of Joseph Smith's journal. Let's go back and find out what it says. Since that time, these documents have been discussed repeatedly in church magazines, in works printed by the church-owned and church-affiliated presses, and by Latter-day Saint scholars in other venues. In addition to the first-hand accounts, there are also five descriptions of Joseph Smith's vision recorded by his contemporaries. The various accounts of the first vision tell a consistent story. Not true. Though naturally, they differ in emphasis and detail. That's because the story is not consistent. Historians expect that when an individual retells an experience in multiple settings to different audiences over many years, each account will emphasize various aspects of the experience and contain unique details. Indeed, differences similar to those in the first vision accounts exist in the multiple scriptural accounts of Paul's vision on the road to Damascus and the apostles' experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. Yet despite the differences, a basic consistency remains across all the accounts of the first vision. Not true, as we will just find out here in a second. Some have mistakenly argued that any variation in the retelling of the story is evidence of fabrication. To the contrary, the rich historical record enables us to learn more about this remarkable event than we could if it were less well documented. So, 1832 account. The earliest known account of the first vision, the only account written in Joseph Smith's own hand, which to me arguably means it should be the most reliable. It's found in a short unpublished autobiography Joseph Smith produced in the second half of 1832. It is the earliest version and therefore the most likely to be correct. In the account, Joseph Smith described his consciousness of his own sins and his frustration at being unable to find a church that matched the one he had read about in the New Testament and that would lead him to redemption. He emphasized Jesus Christ's atonement and the personal redemption it offered. He wrote that the Lord appeared and forgave him of his sins. As a result of the vision, Joseph experienced joy and love, though, as he noted, he could find no one who believed his account. This sort of summary is already vastly different from the story that is told in the missionary lessons and that was recounted in books and movies and songs and art. This saying that Joseph wrote that the Lord appeared and forgave him of his sins is already vastly different because there's only one person 
and there's no mention of which church to join. Let's read the 1832 account here. Joseph Smith's own words. At about the age of 12 years, not 14, my mind became seriously impressed with regard to the all important concerns for the welfare of my immortal soul, which led me to searching the scriptures, believing as I was taught that they contained the word of God and thus applying myself to them. My intimate acquaintance with those of different denominations led me to marvel exceedingly, for I discovered that they did not adorn their profession by a holy walk and a godly conversation, agreeable to what I found contained in that sacred depository. This was a grief to my soul. He's basically saying that the leaders of the churches um, didn't seem to be godly men. They didn't seem to be devout or pious in any way, and he was pretty disturbed by that. Thus, from the age of 12 years to 15, I pondered many things in my heart concerning the situation of the world of mankind, the contentions and divisions, the wickedness and abominations, and the darkness which pervaded the minds of mankind. Now, later on, the church claims that Joseph Smith only had a second grade education, but his vocabulary is obviously very good, and his manner of writing is, seems pretty educated. He says, my mind became exceedingly distressed for I became convicted of my sins. So in other words, he knew he was a sinner. And by searching the scriptures, I found that mankind did not come into the Lord, except they had apostatized from the truth, true and living faith. And there was no society or denomination that was built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ as recorded in the New Testament. I felt to mourn for my own sins and for the sins of the world, for I learned in the scriptures that God was the same yesterday, today, and forever, that he was no respecter of persons, for he was God. For I looked upon the sun, the glorious luminary of the earth, and also the moon rolling in their majesty through the heavens, and also the stars shining in their courses, and the earth also upon which I stood, and the beasts of the field, and the fowls of heaven, and the fish of the waters, and also man walking forth upon the face of the earth in majesty, and in the strength of beauty, whose power and intelligence in governing the things which are so exceedingly great and marvelous, even in the likeness of him who created them. It's pretty charismatic and flowery, I gotta say. And when I considered upon these things, my heart exclaimed, well hath the wise man said, it is a fool that saith in his heart, there is no God. My heart exclaimed, all, all these bear testimony and bespeak an omnipotent and omnipresent power, a being who maketh laws and decreeth and bindeth all things in their bounds, who filleth eternity, who was and is and will be from all eternity to eternity. That's, that's quite a lot to unpack. And I considered all these things and that that being seeketh such to worship him as worship him in spirit and in truth. Therefore, here's a good part. I cried unto the Lord for mercy for there was none else to whom I could go and obtain mercy. And the Lord heard my cry in the wilderness. And while in the attitude of calling upon the Lord, in the other words, while I was praying, in the 16th year of my age, not the 14th year, a pillar of light above the brightness of the sun at noonday came down from above and rested upon me. I was filled with the spirit of God and the Lord opened the heavens upon me and I saw the Lord. That's it, just the Lord. And he spake unto me saying, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Go thy way, walk in my statutes and keep my commandments. Behold, I am the Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world, that all those who believe on my name may have eternal life. Behold, the world lieth in sin at this time, and none doeth good, no, not one. They have turned aside from the gospel, and keep not my commandments. They draw near to me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me. And mine anger is kindling against the inhabitants of the earth, to visit them according to their ungodliness, and to bring to pass that which hath been spoken by the mouth of the prophets and apostles. Behold, and lo, I come quickly, as it is written of me in the cloud, clothed in the glory of my Father. Then Joseph says, My soul was filled with love, and for many days I could rejoice with great joy. The Lord was with me, but I could find none that would believe the heavenly vision. Nevertheless, I pondered these things in my heart, which is incidentally the same thing that Mary said when she realized that an angel had visited her. 
Now, a couple of comments about this account of the first vision, which is the earliest recorded account, the only one recorded in Joseph Smith's own words. And I really just want to say that, first of all, the fact that Joseph Smith could remember that entire soliloquy that was delivered by Jesus Christ is pretty impressive. I mean, that was a long soliloquy to remember all of those words, word for word. Secondly, the language that Joseph uses, um, we see this language throughout the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants, and it's pre pretty clear to me comparing that account of the first vision to his later writings, and the voices match. So the likelihood that he translated the Book of Mormon as opposed to just wrote it, I know a lot of Apologists will say, oh, there's no way Joseph Smith could have come up with all of those names and characters and dates and places. And there's no way that he could have quoted from memory from the Bible all that much. And all of that aside, I just want to say the language in his own writing from the first vision and the language in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price, the voices match. That's all I want to say about that. The other thing is that it just is starkly different. It's objectively different. If you take the two accounts side by side and you compare the facts of what was said, the first vision account that is the most notable and the one that's been canonized by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints clearly says Joseph went into the woods to pray as a boy of 14 years old, that he was overcome with the spirit, a pillar of light came down, he saw two personages, one introduced the other saying, this is my beloved son, hear him. And then Jesus Christ told Joseph his sins were forgiven and then told him that all of the churches on the earth were an abomination and that he should join none of them. Joseph's own account only, first of all, says when he was 16, it does mention the pillar of light, but it only mentions one being. It says the Lord, and he does say that Joseph's sins are forgiven. He says that nobody on the earth is doing good. He doesn't many, mention anything about any churches. He just tells him to go and, you know, go, go your way and keep my commandments and walk in faith. So I just wanted to point out those two things. The missionaries, when they come to visit you in your home, are not going to give you that first version of the first vision. In fact, they're not going to tell you that there's more than one version of the first vision. And if you bring it up, they probably will tell you the same sort of apologetic answer that we read on the church's website, because that's that's the official story and we're not to question the official story. And I also want to note that back on the church's website, they reference the validity of the canonized version with three things that are put out by the church. Let's just go back and look at that one more time because I think it is pretty important. Okay, so in the middle of this paragraph, it says, since that time, these documents have been discussed repeatedly in church magazines, in works printed by the church, and church-affiliated presses, and by Latter-day Saint scholars. So they give four reference points that are all things that are produced by the church. Church magazines, works printed by the church, owned and church-affiliated presses, and Latter-day Saint scholars. Now the church has a committee that's called the Correlation Committee. They meet and make sure that all of those things match and are giving the same message, that there's nothing in the magazine that isn't corroborated also by the church affiliated press, that isn't also corroborated by Latter-day Saint scholars. And that's one of the reasons why a lot of people who study church history end up leaving the church is because the church wants you to keep with the official message, even if the historical documents don't support it, or even if the historical documents support another version of events or another documentation of a different narrative. Now, this doesn't just go for the first vision. It also goes for any of the other lessons that the missionaries are going to teach you. And I will go through those discussions in depth as well, if it's even interesting to anybody. Um, my main interest is just informed consent. I want people to have the whole truth before they make a life altering decision like joining the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I think that it's disingenuous to teach people just parts of things and to not bring up 
both sides of the story and to basically tell people not to read anything that conflicts with the official narrative. As a child, I was taught that anything that conflicted with the official narrative was anti-Mormon lies. And so when someone would bring up the fact that Joseph Smith had a different version of the first vision, I was taught to dismiss it as anti-Mormon lies. And imagine my surprise to find out later as an adult that what was yesterday's anti-Mormon lies are now being published on the official church website as truth and as truth that conflicts with the truth that I was taught as a child. So I felt a lot of anger over that betrayal that I was taught to dismiss things that made logical sense to me in favor of the official narrative. And I later found out that the things that made logical sense actually were true. They weren't lies. So it was really confusing to me. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many people who leave the church are angry is because they feel betrayed. So just to finish up this first discussion from the missionaries, after all of that, there are still two more principles they want to discuss with you. One is that the Book of Mormon is another testament of Jesus Christ. They'll tell you that Joseph Smith found the gold plates buried in a hill. He was directed there by an angel and that he translated those plates into what is now the Book of Mormon. And that's another rabbit hole that we can go down and that I will go down, just not today because it's already getting a little long here. But I just want you to know that that's, this is the next thing they want to teach you is about the Book of Mormon, how it came about, and that the Book of Mormon teaches about Christ and about Christ's visit to the people on this continent after he died, but before he was resurrected, if that makes sense. So there's a lot to unpack there. And the final point of this discussion is that the Holy Ghost is a witness of truth. And they're basically going to teach you how to receive a witness of the Holy Ghost. As we discussed before, they're going to teach you how Mormons pray over here. And we'll go through that as well in another episode. And basically, they're going to leave you that day with a commitment that you're going to read some passages in the Book of Mormon. In fact, I believe they're listed here. Commitments, yes. Remember during this discussion to that the investigator should commit to read in the Book of Mormon and pray to know that it is true, pray to know that Joseph Smith was a prophet, and to set up a, an appointment for the next discussion. So at the end of this, they're going to say, are you free next Tuesday or are you free tomorrow? They like to get these things done as quickly as possible. And then they're going to commit you to do your homework. And then they're going to close with a prayer. They're going to invite you to pray and get you to, to say how you felt after that prayer so that it's going to end up on a really spiritual note. So that's what would have happened in the 80s if you had invited the missionaries into your home. Nowadays, it's a much shorter, streamlined message. And to my mind, honestly, that's a little worse because rather than giving you comprehensive information in the first discussion, they're just going to give you a little snippet of information, try to get you to feel the Holy Ghost and commit you to coming back to coming to church with them on the following Sunday. And then let's say that you invite them in on a Monday. They're going to try to set up another meeting for you like the next day. And, you know, Sunday may be a few days away. So it's possible if you keep inviting them back, you could have two or three or four of these lessons before you ever even visit a Mormon congregation. So that's all for today. It's a lot to unpack. If you're new to the channel, please subscribe. Please share this content with somebody you think will find it valuable. If you interact with the content by sharing it or by saving it to a playlist to listen to later, or even just by liking it or leaving a comment below, that helps the algorithm pick it up and get it out to more people. I recently became a full-time podcaster, so I would really appreciate your support in that way. The best way to support the channel is just to subscribe to like the episodes and to share them. That's completely free. If you have the means to join as a member, I highly recommend it. I do members only content. I do live Q and A's once a week. And I'd really love to have you be a part of our community over at Third Verse. If you're interested in coaching, if you're interested in learning more about the LDS church or managing your own faith crisis or decluttering your house or navigating difficult family relationships, I do coaching on a limited basis a few days a week to individuals who are members of my channel or to subscribers. You can email me at megan at third verse.com or you can just visit my website at third verse.com. I'm also on Instagram and TikTok. 
at third underscore verse. Thanks for being here today. And as always, be good to each other, but even more importantly, be good to yourself.